quarter past, so it's time to begin this. Mm -hmm. Great pleasure to welcome uh, Lars Boy Mortensen. Uh, he is a DS chair of humanities, and uh, he uh, is a center leader of uh, the DT Center uh, for medieval literature. Uh, he's been present here for the last six years, and has been approved for continuation over the next uh, four years. Uh, Lars. Um, I think you've studied saints, right? That's anyway, true. that's true. <laughs> uh, and 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 generally uh, um, has a background in in uh, a range of, of areas uh, in, in in the study of um, of uh, history, historiography, and uh, not the least uh, medieval linguistic expressions. Now we're going to. Uh, uh, share this uh, speech with us, and we are very much looking forward uh, for it. And thanks very much for being here. Yeah, thank you, um, thank you, Tobian. And uh, I'm going to defend the humanist scholars here and actually read at least most of my paper. <laughs> so, um, we'll start off with a a Latin quotation. Yeah, maybe you have seen the title here from Family Honors for Abstract Communities, a Literary Sociology of the Middle Ages. And this is a, a work that's in a way just begun, so this is not published work. Privilegia um, paucorum non faciunt legem communem. The privileges of the few do not make a common law. Today, uh, this could very well be used as a comment on the Brexit negotiations and English exceptionalism, or it could be a quotation from the Bernie Sanders campaign. <laughs> <laughs> it was, in fact, some, something more like the former, explaining the fact that some countries or powers that do not belong to the general order and have exceptional status cannot be an argument against the rationality of the empire, or we would say today, against the rationality of the EU. Uh, but I would uh, like to use this actually as an entry point uh, into my talk about social privilege too, so uh, the Bernie Sanders version. <coughs> Although uh, the 1% were getting away with it, even more in the Middle Ages than they are today, um, the way we talk and argue about social privilege has undergone a complete turnaround, which will be helpful to get on the map first. Before I can approach the more specific problem, how to understand the social uh, role of rising and of intellectuals in the dynamic period of pre-modern Europe, and how, to study, uh, how the study of literature and learning can contribute methodologically and substantially to historical sociology. For those of you uh, who don't read medieval literature on a regular basis, uh, I have picked uh, my first example from a story that you have probably heard of in some form, namely that of the Holy Grail, as it was introduced by the poet uh, Chrétien de Troyes at the end of the 12th century. The motive of the Grail, the, the chalice that Jesus drank from uh, at the Last Supper, enjoys both Monty Python and uh, Indiana Jones fame, uh, or if you prefer 19th century spectacle, uh, Wagner's Parsifal, which also brought it into the mainstream. The hero of Christian's poem is the young uh, Parsifal, whose mother at the outset of the history uh, of the story had decided to bring him up in safety and isolation from the big world. She has lost both her husband and two other sons through nightly combat. Of course, her plan backfires, and Parsifal becomes fascinated with knights and brave deeds and joins the court of King Arthur. Here, the uneducated young man turns out to be a very good, fast learner of both warfare skills and courtly manners. His further adventures with the Grail you may study yourselves. There is only one point of the plot uh, that I want to draw your attention to here. Percival is unaware of the identity of his father uh, or of the family of his mother, but as he comes to realize, he can in fact boast the most noble warrior blood on both sides, which easily explains his own talents. The career he picked was already in his blood and in his right of birth. 
you will recognize this theme from a number of uh, other pre-modern adventures, novels, plays, etc. etc. So the hero or the heroine is gradually unveiled as the true heir of greatness uh, and special powers handed on through his or her ancestral bloodline. And you are allowed to think of Star Wars here, <laughs> uh, which of course too uh, uh, imitates the medieval adventure world. But this motif made much more sense in the pre-modern world and is not one that is easily found in contemporary literature. The idea that the bloodline sets the few apart and that their characters are more powerful, virtuous, beautiful, moral, skilled, intelligent, and simply entitled through their birth is, however, found in mainstream ancient and medieval literature in comedies, novels, romances, and so on. Arguing for the privilege of the 1% today is a completely different game. Although family privilege obviously still exists and runs the world to a large extent, it can no longer function as an argument. Because of the ideal modern entitlement of and freedom of every citizen in our democracies, and because of the communicative and inclusive rationality guiding our discourse, to speak with Habermas, the privileged must name other causes than inborn superiority to advance their position. A very recent Danish example was the passing of a law substantially reducing the tax uh, of family business inheritances. A group of rich businessmen had been lobbying and buying their way into the government parties of Venstre and Liberal Alliance, and the argument was that this was about the common good. First, it would create jobs. Second, if it were you, how would you feel about delivering 15% of, of the value that you had built up through your company? In other words, it concerned us all. It could have been you instead of this millionaire. <coughs> In brief, I will call the medieval argument for privilege aristocratic and the modern one meritocratic it is about who has earned and deserved their position through competence and work. The aristocratic order in Europe was dominant into the 18th and 19th centuries, but meritocratic attitudes were emerging already in the high and late Middle Ages, and very much so in the early modern period of the 16th and 17th centuries. My argument in today's talk will be that the emergence of merit meritocratic voices and ideas are linked also to literature and learning, and they cannot be accounted for only by the rise of new classes in society, for instance, the merchants and the artisans. To understand these links properly, we must also tie them to factors of societal organization, cultural memory, and written discourse itself. In other words, I'm making the case that literature and learning do not only reflect social changes, but also assists in opening a new space in which this dynamic can emerge. First, we must take a detour and look a little closer at the aristocratic order and the pre-modern obsession with the status and power of the dynasties and their leading individuals. The arbitrary aristocratic family structures completely oops, um, they completely set the political agenda um, and they were always the guiding argument. If you happen to watch the new Danish uh, TV series on, on the history of Denmark, uh, you will have noticed that the, uh, in the medieval episodes how everything was dependent on an heir to the throne. To illustrate this strong dynastical principle, we could take examples from all over medieval or early modern Europe. And I have this could be an image of the aristocratic order. It's the wonderful Bamberg Weiser from around 1230, and the colors here are, are virtually added, but they, they must have been colored in the, it must have been colored in the, in the Middle Ages. I have picked uh, Sicily just as a, as a random example of, of how this uh, dynastic principle works. Um, so Sicily had been conquered uh, and organized into a thriving kingdom by Norman Knights during the 11th and 12th century. But in 1194, the German king and emperor of the Hohenstaufen family, Henry VI, conquered Sicily 
claiming it through his marriage with Constance, the daughter of the previous and highly successful Norman King, Roger II. And the literary reference here is Ivanhoe, which you might have seen or, uh, or read, uh, because the big ransom for Richard Lionheart was actually used by Henry to conquer Sicily. Taking over Sicily uh, for the Hohenstaufen dynasty uh, only had a lasting effect uh, because the couple had one son, the remarkable Frederick II, uh, who against all odds was able to claim the Sicilian throne and come to, came to dominate the Mediterranean and imperial politics until his death in 1250. And this is a German 19th century fantasy of the multicultural court of Frederick II in uh, in Sicily, uh, and you see here he's receiving uh, uh, his Arab subjects or Muslim subjects. Um, his father uh, had died uh, when he was three and his mother the year after, uh, but he survived and as a teenager he was able to wrest both the imperial throne and the kingdom of Sicily and Naples from other contenders. Frederick's last heir here he is. This is a, a medieval uh, image of Frederick II on a coin, um, and here is the, the dynasty. Um, so Frederick's last uh, heir, his grandson Conradin, was finally defeated by an alliance uh, of the papacy and the powerful brother of the French king, Charles of Anjou. And to demonstrate that this was really the end of the dynasty, Charles spectacularly beheaded the young Conradin at the Central Square in Naples in 1268. And this is another German 19th century fantasy of that, uh, the righteous Germans suffering at the hands of the nasty French. And this is, of course, this image, was, this picture was painted in 1870, so just at the Franco-Prussian War. <coughs> Charles uh, of Anjou, his rule of Sicily became increasingly unpopular with the local barons who united uh, with other great powers and rebelled against the French at the, f uh, at the famous Sicilian Vespers uprising in 1282. Strikingly again, a dynastic argument was needed <coughs> and found in the rebels' ally Peter III of Aragon, who was married to the last surviving grandchild of Frederick II, also named Constance like his father. In this way, <coughs> Political fortunes were completely dependent on blood relations, and aristocratic women were almost always subject to forced marriages to tie one great family to another. This phenomenon mostly goes unanalyzed in ordinary <coughs> history books. It is simply taken for granted that inheritance of lands and hence of the political and economical power worked like that. The blood line principle, which created so much confusion, instability, and jeopardized long-term uh, long planning by the chance survival of a very few people <coughs> was not only determining events at the level of uh, royal or potentially royal dynasties, but was operative for all significant landowners. If you uh, let the map of medieval Europe evolve, the political map uh, of, of medieval Europe evolve before your eyes, you would see a lot of quick changes all the time. I, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find exactly this uh, <laughs> animation, but uh, you will find very, very quick changes uh, all the time, and these were not due to conquest, but they were due to uh, haphazard uh, family connections, marriages, deaths, and so on. <coughs> to understand better how this very poor organizational principle was accepted by everyone, we have to pause a moment and consider what it would really be like to live in a society of relatively few resources and so many risks. While modern historians have a tendency to focus on kings and powerful lords and see their policies as simply optimizing autocratic domination over peasants, artisans and merchants, partly in competition with each other and partly in competition with the other great landowner, the church, we should not forget that the lower strata of, uh, in society place great hopes in their lords and rulers. They did not have much else to cling to, except perhaps a rival lord, uh, whom they would then have to hope to live longer. We have to remember that, seen from the middle or the bottom of the medieval power hierarchies, the lords were not only oppressors of the, uh, or, or the 1%, they were equally 
the only source of protection and justice. The immense awe, respect and hope that a Lord, King, Bishop or Pope could inspire was an effect of a person-centered society with weak institutions, but those feelings of belonging and hope <coughs> were no less real for that. The less secure one's life situation, the more fragile your alliance to a certain nobleman or bishop who might pass away tomorrow, the greater the emotional investment, often turning into devotion and expressed in religious terms. This also helps to explain why the heirs were extremely important. Everything was invested in the only bond of continuity that was visible, the bond of blood, and therefore kinship and dynasty carried so much with a social weight for high and low. In both classical and medieval literature, we find abundant praise of both living and dead rulers, so abundant that we, as modern readers, cannot help, but cannot help smiling or perhaps thinking of modern autocratic regimes. But this is a false analogy. Praises of rulers and their offspring and the dreams of sudden peace and bounty all due to a new king made much more sense in the pre-modern world in which the protectors at the top were seen in a divine light. For the new issue of the journal that we are publishing, uh, Interfaces, we put up this uh, call for papers on the uh, uh, theory and phenomenology of love as it is represented in, in medieval literature. But we received a very surprising and very brilliant paper by Lorenzo Livorsi uh, and it's just been published. In this paper, he shows that the language of love and longing developed by the most prominent erotic poet of the Roman Empire, Ovid, was reused some centuries later in order to shower the emperor with love and affection, and again in the early Middle Ages by a poet, Fortunatus, who praises a high officer of the Frankish king in uh, erotic terms. While such language is informed by a literary tradition, it still gives us access, I would think, to the deep devotion often felt by medieval subjects. Let me also quote the praise of the greatest Danish medieval author, Saxo Grammaticus. There's a new English translation of him uh, that I'm quoting from. This is the famous <coughs> Archie fragment, so Saxo's uh, draft copy that, that we have a little fragment of in the Royal Library. Um, let me just uh, quote this uh, from the, the, the uh, beginning of his history where he's talking about uh, Valdemar, so the, the resistor of Valdemar, the second, the victorious. So, my gracious Lord and Father of us all, brilliant light of our country, Valdemar, whose illustrious descent from early times I will be describing, I beg you to look kindly on the wavering course of this labor, for I fear that I sh shall be shackled by the weight of my subject and far from probably depicting your lineage, I shall sooner reveal my lack of aptitude and meager talents. By remarkably enla enlarging the wide realm inherited from your father through subjugation of your neighbors, by encompassing in the toil of extensive conquest the ebbing and flowing of the waters of the Elbe, you have added no mean element of glory to the distinguished register of your fame. Thus, by the scale of your achievements, you overlapped the reputation of your predecessors, even to the extent of making armed warfare on parts of the Holy Roman Empire. Everyone knows your well-practiced courage and philanthropy, so that one cannot measure which is greater, the terror struck into your foes on the battlefield, or the gratification felt by our citizens at your mildness. Your resplendent grandfather, too, the sanctified object of public the devotion who achieved immortal glory through an undeserved death now awes with his radiant holiness the, pe uh, the people over whom he was once victorious. More valor than blood flowed from his venerable wounds. And the grandfather of Valdemar, sire Valdemar the Victorious, is Knut Lavard, Knut Lavard um, who is, and here's some of the Genealogy, uh, Knud Levard and other uh, Danish uh, nobles and kings are uh, buried in, uh, in St. Pet in Ranister. <coughs> the ruler was talked of as a god walking the earth. And in this context of dynasty, it's especially instructive to see how much emphasis Saxo puts on the bloodline of Valdemar 
and his famous uh, father, Valdemar the Great, and his grandfather, Knut Lavard, who was really a half-god, namely a saint. The dynasty is the only guarantee for stability and continuity, and so much the better that it has so <coughs> obvious a divine recognition. Being a saint meant that Knut Lavard was potentially present all the time, could be prayed to and invoked as a divine witness for oaths between noblemen. This is an example of how the Im immaterial bonds of human networks were tied very directly to a body of a man, in this case to his remains, which were interred in Einstein. To visualize how important this type of embodiment of cultural memory and social continuity was in pre-modern societies, think of the lengths that the ancient Egyptians uh, and Chinese uh, went in the went to in order to ensure that the continued bodily existence of the passed away kings, the elaborate mummification of the pharaohs, sons of gods, or the even more daunting jade suits that were made for Chinese rulers when they were interred. This is the same that happened to the bones of Knut Lavard, although it doesn't look as great as this. Um, we have lost the powerful individual that held together human obligations, provided safety and justice, and communicated with God, or the gods. And by sacralizing the bodily remains, we make sure that his soul may be safe and still with us. In another metaphor, the ruler's human body is dead, but the body politic, symbolized by his exalted remains, lives on. And here I'm referring to a very famous book from, from the mid-20th century, and some claim it's the, one of the best books about medieval history written in the 20th century, The King's Two Bodies of <coughs> Kanto Olish. The saintly nature of kings, whether they were pronounced saints and had a cult like Knut Lavard or not, should obviously be seen together with the entire crowd of saints, which were the link between this world and the beyond. For all aspects of social life, saints were intermediators and negotiators, and their earthly remains the concrete guarantee of a connection between past, present, and future. The saints also embodied uh, social ideals of different kinds, from humility to bravery, and from serene simple-mindedness to deep wisdom. These are the kinds of things that we today write into constitutions, educational programs, and corporate values. And maybe some of you remember we we were donated a cup uh, in oh. <laughs> SDU with, uh, uh, with three values. I forgot what they were now, but, uh, um, but this is the kind of association perhaps one should have. Um, so the point is uh, that I'm trying to make uh, is, is simply that values, hopes, uh, and aspirations in the Middle Ages were represented by a human body or the remains of a body ultimately all related in the all-compassing body of Christ, the model God-man. So, to sum up the first part of my paper, in, in a modern comparison, rulers and lords in pre-modern societies lived risky and often short lives, but their personal importance was all the more striking. They truly embodied government, and an enormous emotional and religious effort were needed to carry over their dead bodies into the next body of government <coughs> in order to have a body policy at all. To us, this seems magical and strange. But just, how, just imagine how absolutely magical it would have seemed to them, how relaxed we are with the passing of government to someone new. Because we have strong institutions and the divide between the lawmakers, the executives, and the judiciary which actually exists nowhere but in our complex social minds and in a huge body of writings. How was the strong dominance of kinship and dynasty then challenged in the Middle Ages? It is a poor organizational principle, basically the default mode in the lack of more sophisticated resources, but it was doing well on its own terms when alternatives began to be experimented with beginning in the 11th and 12th centuries. Before I list some of the alternative forms um, of social organization, I just want to approach uh, the aristocratic order a little bit through historical sociology. And I find the four-tiered model here by Michael Mann uh, attractive as a flexible version and, or a combination of Marxist and Weberian views. 
um, and it is unfolded in a, in, a, in a grand narrative that he has given in his books. So man's proposal uh, is to drop the concept of society as a starting point. It's always too vague anyway, uh, and surprisingly hard to delimit, especially in the pre-modern age. Instead, he takes his point of departure in intersecting networks, and there are four fields of social action, so or sources of power, as he, as he calls it, ideology, uh, economy, military politics, the, EI, the IEMP model. These four spheres have different separate logics, and importantly, have no predefined hierarchy amongst them. Important transformations of empires, states, or social groups can happen either due to the agenda set in, uh, in the military sphere, uh, or by economics, politics, or ideology, and in different combinations of these. Man's model then also allows for the potential uh, primacy of changes in the sphere he names uh, ideology, which also then includes, includes religion and all kinds of cultural, scientific, literary, and artistic expressions. Uh, so if we map a little bit our concerns about literature and learning onto this uh, system, uh, we can see in the military sphere is present everywhere uh, uh, in the values and lifestyle of the nobility and it is the dominant theme of medieval literature. In the course of the High Middle Ages, the European knighthood achieved a more integrated group identity through crusades and other things. Uh, new chivalric codes of honor, and, and they were also flirting with better manners. In both romances, chronicles, and law codes, we find an obvious and strong re reflection of the fact that fighting on horseback was what gave the aristocracy their visible identity and social justification. Even non-noble authors who wrote romances like Chrétien de Troyes uh, or chronicles highlighted the constant importance of war and the crucial honor uh, that it brought to nobility. <coughs> in economic terms, the aristocracy, of course, relied on uh, owning the land in various complex hierarchies of dependency and entitlements. The most important feature, seen from a modern point of view, was that land was rarely sold, but was divided, assembled, and handed on through heritage and marriage, thus displaying the obvious link between dynasty and the chief resource of wealth in the medieval world. The actual working of the land was taken care of by despised serfs, tenants, and small freeholders, almost never mentioned in literature, and needless to say, without any voice in writing at all. The political domain <coughs> was also completely dominated by the high nobility, and again, the dynastic structures were the most important mechanism to extend influence. <coughs> Politics and war were, of course, intimately connected and the conflict uh, and conflict solving among the highest nobles was a source of honor which was celebrated in literature or it was a source of dishonor which would then could then be processed camouflaged and negotiated through literature in the ideological sphere we encounter a more complex picture and this is also where we meet different forms of um, alternative social organizations on the one hand, the aristocratic values of honor and family are expressed uh, quite directly, but on the other, they are surrounded and supported by a much more complex ideological system, that of the ever-evolving Christian belief. I have taken some very drastic shortcuts uh, here, uh, as the relation between social ideals and Christian moral and theological doctrine is a daunting topic in itself. In this context, it may be useful to begin by stating that it was in the ideological sphere in the 11th and 12th centuries that we see the first real alternative to kinship and dynastic organization. And this happens in the new, organiz in the new organization of the monastic orders <coughs> and of the secular clergy in the expanding episcopal structure of papal Europe. From the 11th century, the priests and of course their masters, the bishops, and so on, were expected to be celibate, and in this way be extracted from the dominant kinship structure. And from the 12th and 13th century, we get the new monastic orders, most famously the Cistercians, Franciscans, and Dominicans, with their extremely strong corporate identities and European-wide networks. The key principle 
of social organization here is election by a college of the bishop, the pope, the abbot, or the master general of the order. The fact that the leaders in these organizations were not supposed to have offspring or to have the other family benefit from their office was a radical break with the otherwise dominant dynastic principle. To a large degree, these principles were responsible for highly dynamic pockets of more rational organization. The Cistercians famously driving forward agric uh, agricultural technology, while Franciscans and Dominicans shaped both universities and hospitals through <coughs> the 13th century. Um, and the universities were also strongly supported by the papacy, which in itself developed a bureaucracy during the 12th and 13th centuries, which would later be imitated by secular authorities and emerging nation states. And finally, the military orders served <coughs> as uh, elite troops. So in all of these, we see a, a much more efficient social organization, you can say, um, and dynamic. These ecclesiastical organizations without family concerns obviously need a very strong corporate and religious identity for their coherence in order to counteract the lack of kinship ties. Uh, you may want to object to this narrative in several ways. Um, first of all, one could say that, well, the papacy and these orders, uh, some, some orders have actually existed before the 11th and 12th, uh, 13th centuries. Um, but uh, well, I can just say very briefly, maybe we can discuss it, but basically um, the way the church was living before the 11th century was very much tied to local, uh, the local uh, nobility and, and did not form a, um, a coherent international uh, structure like this. Uh, and I should also say that that I don't think that it's a very good idea to talk about the church as a political actor, especially not in the early period. There was never a church with specific goals throughout the Middle Ages, uh, but if we try to put it in Michael Mann's framework, a number of intersecting uh, and competing networks, all claiming to have a special role in the divine order. Another objection uh, uh, would, could be that the people in the ecclesiastical organizations they were mainly recruited from the nobility itself, also in the period that I'm concentrating on here, and that their loyalty remained with these landowning noble families. Um, this is certainly true to a large extent. The bonds of secular society uh, to secular society was, were still strong, and certain conflicts between ecclesiastical organizations and secular powers can often be read as nobility conflicts in disguise. Yet, the growing strength of these organizations not operating directly on kinship principles did make a difference for how networks behaved, as did the strong corporate identity and the different types of Christian ideology they provided. All these types of, uh, all these organizations were led by people who were elected, typically by a privileged groups of senior male members, and they were appointed for life. And this is uh, important. This meant two things, pulling in two different directions. The election for office, however undemocratic uh, it may seem from a modern point of view, necessarily emphasized an element of competence and education, in other words, of meritocratic values. The people at the top were qualified, or they were supposed to be. In practice, a great amount of nepotism, politics, etc put uh, many, pe many incompetent people in these positions, but it did mean that criticism could be formulated in terms of competence and lack of competence, which was entirely irrelevant in the aristocratic kin kinship order. What was drawing more in the traditional direction was the appointment for life. Think about where we still follow this principle in the 21st century. I don't know what comes to mind. Important positions where people are um, appointed for life. The Pope. Exactly. That's that's my first. Uh, <laughs> that's my first example. The other example is something that's in the news all the time, namely the American Supreme Court. Um, but it is exceptional today, um, 
and it creates a strange unpredictability in the whole organization. In the medieval context, uh, we can note that appointment for life to a large degree perpetuated the embodiment of political power. The bishops, abbots, order generals, popes, etc. were entrusted with some uh, of the same sacrality as kings and the high nobility. In spite of the non-kinship electoral process, the transfer of power must still have had some of the connotations of the transfer of uh, secular power from one respected, perhaps even sacralized, dead body to another living body. But the guarantee of proper transfer rested with an institutionalized college rather than the bloodline. And this leads us to the third uh, and final organizational principle, which you may already have guessed. Collegial bodies whose heads are appointed not by kinship, nor for life. And I'm thinking in particular of these three. Uh, so city communes, mainly in Italy, guilds uh, in all major towns, and universities from around 1200. The idea that qualified people go into retirement or rotate frequently at the head of an organization has become second nature <coughs> to us. This is how most entities, public and private, function today. But in the Middle Ages, it was the most innovative form. In all three instances, it is related to the remarkable urbanization of all over Europe in the period be between the mid 11th century and 1300. The main resources behind the communes, guilds, and universities were urban, that is to a large degree based on the wealth of trade and crafts rather than land. They were all held together by the swearing of oaths and gradually by written statutes and recognized legal status. In all three cases, it was a haphazard and confused process which led to the innovation, not any premeditated plan, but the result of unexpected pressures and possibilities. And this is stressed by this fairly new authoritative book on the, on the Italian communes, you see it's called Sleepwalking into a New World, the emergence of the Italian city communes in the 12th century, uh, that this was not a, a premeditated uh, process. <coughs> While many Italian cities turned to dynastic lordship uh, again in the 13th century, this did not mean that town magistrates with rotating offices were obsolete, and indeed we find them over most of Europe in the late, later Middle Ages. A city governance structure of this type functioned together with guilds, uh, the corporations of artisans and, um, and merchants, which emerged also in the 12th century and which became a major organizational force in late medieval towns. Guilds were basically, uh, were basically urban professional self-help groups and the equality of the accepted members and their elective representatives uh, made them a key instance in this category. I just hasten on to the last one, which is the universities, uh, and which is of course more important for intellectual uh, history. The first universities uh, came into view around 1200, Bologna, Paris, Oxford, Salerno, and other places. What you need to know very briefly in this context is simply, they emerged basically as guilds for students and teachers, but quickly found themselves between conflicting interests of towns uh, and local se secular and ecclesiastical authorities. And through the active support of the papacy, the teachers and students' unions then acquired a common governance which could represent the whole organization. These organizations developed, like the communes, in a haphazard manner. But the bottom line is that during the 13th century, we suddenly have a number of intellectually powerful institutions whose leadership principle is rotation. At one point in this development, the Franciscan and Dominican professors were so strong, especially in Paris, that the university might have opted for lifelong leadership, but it did not happen. Um, and by refusing to go that way, they became the be curious institutions that we uh, uh, favor today. And, um, and even with their papal backing, they were driving theology, philosophy, and other branches of knowledge into unforeseen and uncontrollable waters. How does literature and the values expressed through intellectual culture tie in with these patterns? In my search for an alternative 
uh, to the aristocratic kinship order. I have found that there is no such thing as the values of a supposedly unified church, uh, opposed to aristocracy or king. Um, <coughs> This is a classic opposition in, in, in historical writing, but I don't think that, that the study of literature bears this out. And only occasionally is there a one-to-one -one relationship between the social position of an author and the values he or she espouses. Writers of aristocratic origins may have been leading university intellectuals like Thomas Aquinas. Non-aristocratic writers may be hired hands, singing the praises and shaping the fantasies of the knightly class. And historians like Sacro Grammaticus, uh, employed in a medium high position in the Episcopal hierarchy, may promote a die-hard warrior lifestyle. In order to understand the ever-growing meritocratic voices in the high and late Middle Ages, we need to look at those more fundamental uh, features, namely what I've been talking about, new forms of uh, social organization, and also uh, the power of writing itself. And as for the organizational forms, I have already made my point clear, I think, uh, with an ever-increasing impact of both ecclesiastical and se secular organizations without kinship inheritance, no matter how elitist or closed in other ways, the idea that literary education was needed could not help spreading. When the head of an organization was elected for life, there was still a fair amount of sacralization of that person as the embodied carrier of common values, but in the towns, guilds, and universities, the values were attached to a more abstract entity. And in this way, the cracks had developed uh, in the aristocratic edifice when it became clearer that competence and merit, the resulting networks and the resulting networks of power, could very well exist without an aristocratic bloodline. And the second point uh, concerns the specifics of writing and literary culture. And there are two sides of this coin. A certain amount of written texts were necessary to keep up and develop both the ecclesiastical and secular organizations, and especially the papacy, the Dominicans, and the universities made it their specialty to cultivate and enlarge this body of writing. And this affected bureaucratic, legal, theological, philosophical, scientific, and literary, in our sense of literary, writing. And it was the basis of uh, it was with the same basis of education that was needed for all of them. This being the case, now think of the perspective of an individual who acquired the literate and learned skills, especially someone who might not come from the absolute highest social levels. To master this art and become a notary, lawyer, chronicler, theologian, or even poet was an enormous privilege which opened a world of possibilities in just one generation. <coughs> the resources of the great tradition, uh, in the words of the anthropologist Redfield, were at your fingertips in a matter of 15 or 20 years of education. A shocking shortcut in comparison with the nobility whose great tradition of family honor took hundreds and hundreds of years to acquire. The power of writing can perhaps be said to have an inbuilt meritocratic mechanism. This mechanism is something I, I still want to explore, but I do think its potentially inherent dynamic uh, is overlooked by Michael Mann's model in which learning and literature belonging to ideology will tend to appear as passive reflections rather than shapers of new social relations. I'm just at the end now. Um, these medieval uh, innovations happened gradually and were not necessarily noticed by the social groups and individuals involved. Moreover, emergent social phenomena do not get uh, new iconic names just when they appear. They have to borrow from existing ideas and vocabulary and can thus be camouflaged both for contemporaries and for modern scholars. And I just want to finish by giving you two examples of this. <coughs> In the noble kingship, kinship, um, warrior order of things, honor uh, was a key concept. If you read modern books about medieval history, there will be extensive discussions of power, influence, and resources, but these were mostly talked of uh, then as honor. A man of honor directly implied a land-owning nobleman 
and the honor of the family or dynasty was firmly attached to the head of the family and to his or her physical being. It was the honor accrued through <coughs> generations that had to be transferred physically to the next heir. In other words, honor was always embodied. From the beginning of the 12th century and on, uh, 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 from the beginning of the 12th century, that we find, as has been argued by Bernweiser in this book, uh, we find a lot of Italian documents uh, that begin to talk about Hono Civitatis, so the honor of the city. While the city did indeed have physical symbolic presence, for instance in its main monuments or in its patron saint, um, and I have a picture here of the 13th, 14th century um, uh, town hall of Siena, uh, on which uh, ours here in Odense is uh, based. Um, so while the, the, the communes, uh, the cities did have a physical uh, symbolic presence, uh, it is still striking uh, to have such an embodied concept of honor transferred from the world of nobility to that of the abstract community of the city. And my final example uh, uh, concerns the, uh, the concept of noble and <coughs> nobility itself. And so Dante, and this is from another work, but this is a Renaissance portrait of Dante Alighieri, uh, he discusses in his uh, rich but unfinished treatise on poetics, learning and authority, the convivio written shortly uh, before the Divine Comedy, around uh, 1308. He discusses uh, nobility. And here he quotes, he starts by saying, one ruler of the empire described nobility, and, and from the context we actually know who, whom he is thinking of here, it is our friend from before, Frederick II, the Hohenstaufen Emperor. He had said, Describe nobility as consisting, in his view, of age-old wealth, together with pleasing manners. And someone else, of a shallower cast of mind, after mulling over this dictum, dispensed with the last feature, because he himself perhaps did not actually possess it. They all follow in his steps, who count uh, a man noble if he comes from a family that has been very rich for a considerable time. So entrenched has this quite false opinion become in our society, that people call any man noble who can say, I am the grandson or son of such and such, a worthy person, even if he himself is a good for nothing. Um, Bandit goes on to explain in a, uh, his own poem and discuss the concept of nobility. And he argues strongly against Frederick's twofold definition in which nobility consists of old wealth and manners. Instead, Bandit links it to, the number of, uh, to a number of virtues and the search for knowledge and wisdom. In fact, wealth can often be detrimental to real nobility because it is a distraction. In this radical revision of the term nobility, Dante has completed the move from embodied nobility to disembodied, and he implies that nobility can be acquired in principle by anyone within a single generation. In his clear treatment of the issue, we can see how learning and literature, merit meritocracy and abstraction go hand in hand. Thank you. Actually, I sort of won, but it's it's quite pedestrian. So it goes like this. Uh, so continuity through bloodline, I thought it was very fascinating. And then <coughs> fast forward to our colleagues in economics that would say continuity through property rights. And um, so in between that, you, you, you know, uh, you pointed to some sources of that transition, uh, but it seems more or less to be where we are. Um, and one part of that is codification through writing, and um, how that facilitated then uh, uh, legal rules and uh, using those and pro uh, as, as a context for promoting property rights. Now, going back to what you presented here, um, how does that strike you? 
Is that too simplified a picture? Of course it is. Uh, but sort of, what's the stuff in the middle, in the Middle Ages? Um, so you pointed to uh, the disembodiment, in a way, of, of, of nobility. Uh, I found that fascinating. So the disembodiment of also the bloodline, so to say, to property rights. Could you point to a bit more here, or? Yes, I'm. I'm not most very, most very so. relevant, <laughs> but I'm not a legal historian myself, so I, I'm sure there is a lot to, to say from, from that point of view. But it is exactly in this time of of legal history, in, so yeah. in the universities in, in, in the 12th and 13th century, that uh, that that uh, a discussion of, of property rights and and, uh, and also of of, of uh, economy uh, takes takes place. But I, I think. Uh, when I said that the aristocratic order continues until the 17th or 18th century and so on, it is just because of the simple fact that, that, that we need to have the, the three powers separated in order to see how we work in the modern world. Right. And that's just, uh, it was just a way of saying, let's, let's try and get rid of that and, and, <laughs> and, and imagine a world before that, mm. where actually all um, all issues that came up through this hierarchy was one hierarchy. Yeah, it was, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, you couldn't go to the judge and get another opinion because that right. was the judge. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, Lars, I, I wanted to uh, bring up two things that might complicate this a little bit. One is in the notion of uh, idoneity or uh, idoneus, if, uh, because there was often a case where nobles would be judged as incapable of carrying out, no, they had the opportunity to carry out certain tasks because they were noble, but they were judged incapable of doing it and then set aside. And one example, there's a count of uh, the heir to the county of Aino, who uh, they decided that he was too simple to be involved in aristocratic life, and so they sent him off to the church. Uh, and But there is this notion that it's not simply your bloodline, but then you also have to be capable of carrying out the tasks uh, which you're supposed to be able to, to carry out. So it's, it's, I think it complicates a little bit the notion between aristocracy and meritocracy and that it's, you're an aristocrat but you also have to be able to do very physically what an aristocrat is supposed to be able uh, to do. And then on the other end, there's the question for, I don't know what it is in Danish law, but in, in American law, that if I die intestate without a, without a, uh, a will, my property is distributed equally among my heirs so that our legal system is still, I, and I've often talked to my students about this, that I, I may not find my children worthy of, of inheriting, but, but they're the ones that the law say are, are, are going to inherit, so. No, thank you for that. It, it, no, no, it, this was quite a black and white uh, sketch I, I, I made here. But, but I think that, uh, so in terms of the, the very important uh, heirs to dukes and kings and so on, there you would actually accept a lot of inability and they would still be the heir. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, so, but no, thank you for, for that. Okay. Yes, I was, I was curious about uh, technology. I mean, you, you named the guilds and uh, monastic orders. I suppose that they were part of it. I mean, who owned the technology? Who knew and who spread it? in Europe, say. That's my question to you. That's a big question. <laughs> um, I guess in the, in the, among the artisans, uh, the, there were certain traditions that were also kept to themselves. Uh, but there was no, I mean, there was no copyright. <laughs> so uh, there, there, there was no, uh, sort of, yeah, there wasn't a copyright. Ideas. But how did the thing spread? I mean, if you get yeah. a good idea, yeah, a new yeah. way no, to... No, so, uh, I mean, innovations in agriculture and so on, I yeah. mean, they spread through those elite networks, uh, basically. Um, I don't know, Thomas, if you... Uh, well, uh, it, it's word of mouth. It's one of those wonderful riddles of new history that what you've got for technology is not written down, but mm -hmm. if you look at cathedrals, yeah. These are clearly masterpieces. We have no idea exactly how they built them. But there's a, a sort of, well, you could say, 
inherent knowledge, uh, but also I mean, these are traveling parts, yeah. and so that they teach each other. But this is very hard for us to map. And during late and late, you see increasing guilt that they come together with the pe people that Lars have described um, to get worlds to meet. Again, the guilt that Lars talked about and, and the monastic orders, all of that. So there's accumulation of this sort of knowledge. That it gets written down. So there is there isn't a medieval equivalent of Apple, for instance, or Facebook. <laughs> ah, no, <laughs> no, not for, for many reasons. reasons. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, All right. Nicholas. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for this. Uh, what I think was a great reminder to not sort of uh, or not underestimate the Middle Ages. How you know, if you come from sociology, you have Weber or Durkheim, and for them sort of functional differentiation and the importance of organization sort of starts with a modern society sort of uh, short cutting or, 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 or short changing I think the complexity before. My question is this though, I mean isn't these kind of organizations like guilds or, or, or universities, isn't that just kind of a very different animal than, than states? I mean you can you sort of label them both as communities but I mean a state for example uh, you know or, or these organizations are, are Organized around physical or, or spatial proximity, right? Often the same building, the same city. They, there are people that share very particular sets of knowledge, and, and embodied knowledge, and tools, and so on. Whereas the states uh, require some form of imagined community, as we would say in sociology. Yeah, yeah that's right. right. And, I mean, even today, that you know, the, the Trump followers call him the God Emperor, which is uh, sort of only half ironic, I think. So, in some sense, uh, in, in uh, some way, we, we still, you know, like to look up to maybe church or Charlie Gould or whatever in, in these kind of uh, uh, idealizing functions, which is sort of has a functional reason. No, thank you. No, no you're absolutely right. But, um, I mean, there's a very big discussion about state formation and so on, and, and it's been a, a long trend of, of uh, uh, research in, in, the, in the sort of late Middle Ages and, and the early modern period, the, the state formation. But, but basically, you're right that, that what I'm talking about, and that's why I call it abstract communities rather than imagined communities, uh, because those communities were actually close, as you say, universities and, and towns and so on. They, they, they did see each other, but it became an abstract legal entity. It, 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 it could, there was something that suddenly could act on, <laughs> on behalf of everyone, uh, and that was a new uh, thing, especially that, that it was not invested into one person. Uh, that, that was a new thing. But, uh, so, so in a way, yeah, compared to states, whenever we want to say that they develop, whether it's in the 16th century or, or what, uh, sort of huge, much more complex uh, structures, and uh, that, so that's, that's absolutely true. Um, that's what I think about. Yeah. Thank you. So, a very last yeah, question. Yeah, I have a question and a partial answer along the same lines. I was wondering if states can be also the basis for a new kind of uh, um, allegiances. I was thinking of the military orders, for instance, the Knights of Malta, where it's true that they, were, they had a, a physical um, place where they met, but they were organized on, uh, in houses named according to the different nations, a House of France, a House of Italy, a House of England, and also they were spread over, all over Europe for the attacks, so the, it was abstract and it was a community and not based on blood, uh, I mean, blood uh, relationship. So uh, do you think that these can be yeah, yeah, the basis yeah. for... I just briefly mentioned them, but uh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, but, uh, no, that's a good supplement. So thank you so much, Lars, and uh, we have a little gift here for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is uh, something. Too. And thanks so much for the yeah, talk. Sure. Thanks.